can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Love, as Johnny Cash reminds us, is a burning thing. And some people believe it can be felt the first time you gaze upon someone that you can develop deep, real feelings for someone just by looking at them. Is such a thing possible? And if you did fall suddenly and intensely in love with someone you just met, and later, those deep, real feelings were tested by the revelation of a deep, dark secret, would you hang on to it no matter what that secret was? Or what it cost? Unbraided. Before we start the story, I want to thank all of my listeners who supported me for the Audioverse Awards. Thank you for your votes. Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs was honored as one of the best new story-based productions of 2022. Wow! Which makes this the perfect time to remind you not only to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app or Audible, but rate and review on the platforms that allow you to do so. And share with everyone you know who enjoys a good, award-winning story. Thanks again. Now back to our regularly scheduled tale of love and horror. Unbraided Do you believe in love at first sight? If you had asked me that question a year ago, I would have given you a long-winded answer about biochemical reactions and hormones creating a flood of endorphins that engendered a false sense of infatuation which your mind interpreted as love. I would have insisted it was all an illusion. Love is objectively something that requires a deeper knowledge of a person, who they are, what they believe, what their innermost desires are, and it's impossible to know any of that just by looking at someone. I literally would have laughed in your face if you told me you were in love with someone you hadn't met solely based on their looks. What a short-sighted fool I was. Of course, I hadn't met Claire yet. I first saw Claire Kinsley at the Art Institute. I didn't normally spend my afternoons in galleries lined with paintings, moving from room to room silently trying to appreciate the masterpieces, daring me not to comprehend their true beauty. But I was meeting a friend who worked there for lunch. I was early, he was running late, so I wandered around the interconnected rooms, studying more the people looking at the art rather than the art itself. I always found it fascinating when someone became so engrossed in a portrait or a landscape that they felt compelled to study every little detail. It was while I was people-watching that my gaze fell upon Claire that first time. What was most surprising to me was that I didn't even need to see all of her to fall in love. My initial glimpse was of her back, and the long, thick braid of coal-black hair that hung between her bare shoulder blades, ending in a flare of silky locks cinched into the shape of a large tulip bulb by a bejeweled clip. She stood tall, the hem of her elegant slacks hovering just the perfect distance above her practical yet stylish shoes. Nearly invisible straps suspended her crimson blouse, which draped her form like a sheet concealing a sculpture before its unveiling. Cupid's arrow struck me like a thunderbolt. Something about how she held herself, the strength conveyed by the posture of her shoulders, the simplicity of the braid of ebony strands hanging down the center of her back, told me more in a single glance than I would have been able to glean from an intense internet search of her entire history on Earth. I couldn't explain it, but I was in love. Not lust, not infatuation, but true and undeniable love. And I hadn't even seen her face yet. I was simultaneously compelled to approach her and frozen in place. As if sensing my paradoxical dilemma, she turned around and looked at me. Her face was simply perfect. You might not consider her visage worthy of gracing the cover of some fashion magazine. She didn't have that classical combination of high cheekbones, plump lips, and large, perfectly spaced eyes 
that exemplified the modern definition of beauty. Her features were sharp and soft. Her eyes conveyed a seriousness of purpose, a confidence of intention. But the smile lifting the corners of her thin lips expressed a goofiness that stood in contrast to the rest of her visage. She flawlessly combined the ridiculous and the sublime. I couldn't remember if we were initially so near to each other when I first laid eyes on her, or if I'd walked closer without being consciously aware, but she was now within an arm's length close enough for me to smell the bouquet of her perfume. Hello, she said. Her voice was musical, and the way she enunciated those simple syllables elevated her basic greeting into poetry. Hi, I said back, instantly fearful that my response was insufficient to warrant any more of her attention. But that magical smile grew broader. Her head tilted slightly to one side as she studied my face. Do I know you? she asked. No, I replied. I would have remembered you. My explanation made her laugh. Cheerful notes that lifted my soul, causing me to smile as well. Well, maybe we should remedy our mutual deficiency of not knowing each other. She extended a slender hand, the nails immaculately manicured, and I automatically took it into my own. Her skin was warm and soft. My name's Claire, she said. Dan, I replied. Claire grasped her other hand around mine, engulfing it in a knot of soothing fingers. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Dan. Are you an artist or just a patron? This lug? Another voice interjected. I turned to see my friend Ivan, smiling mischievously at us. He wouldn't know a Picasso from a Denny's placemat, he said, clapping me on the back. Claire let go of my hand and took a step back. Who's your friend? Ivan asked me. We just met. I replied. I'm Claire, she added. I was secretly glad that she didn't offer to shake Ivan's hand as she had mine. Well, Claire, Danny Boy and I were just about to have lunch. Would you like to join us? I looked at her expectantly, but she became instantly sheepish, bowing her head as if embarrassed. I'm actually meeting someone myself. She raised her eyebrows, hopefully. Perhaps another time? She asked me, clearly excluding Ivan from the invitation. I'd like that very much, I answered. She pulled the slender smartphone from a hidden pocket and swiped its screen to life. What's your number? I relayed the digits of my phone number, and once she finished tapping them in, my phone buzzed. That's mine, she said. Call me. I will, I promised. Claire ended the call on her end, and my phone fell silent. She nodded politely at Ivan, then offered me a parting smile as she turned and walked away her braid wagging subtly across her back. Dude, what was that all about? Ivan asked me. I think I'm in love, I responded, as I watched Claire disappear around a corner. I didn't wait long to call Claire. I found her that evening. She answered on the first ring. Hello, Dan. I'm glad you called. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk more this afternoon, I told her. My friend, Ivan, Claire cut me off. I don't want to hear about Ivan, she said. I want to know all about Dan. We spoke for hours that night. Afterward, it felt like we had known each other for years. We made plans to have dinner the next night, then followed that with an afternoon at the Natural History Museum and a play the subsequent evening at a small theater in the basement of a tiny bookstore. During most of our time together, we held hands, our fingers entwined, conveying moments of excitement and joy with gentle squeezes and subtle caresses. I wanted to kiss her, but each time when it seemed like the right moment, Claire would deflect my intention with a question or point out an interesting architectural feature or plant nearby. At the end of our first week together, while we were dining at a quiet Italian restaurant, I confessed my feelings for her. Claire, I love you, I said, suddenly fearful that my declaration would be the end of a relationship. But instead of being put off by my amorous pronouncement, she leaned forward into the candlelight and said, I love you too, Dan. Our first kiss was intoxicating. In that moment, it didn't seem unusual to me that I had declared my love for Claire before that kiss. But afterward, I felt assured that my feelings were undeniably validated. I escorted Claire back to her home, a beautiful brick bungalow nestled among similar structures in a quiet neighborhood on the city's north side. Would you like to come inside? She invited. 
Yes, I replied. She opened the door, led me inside, and took me to her bedroom. We consummated our love that night. The next morning I woke to find Claire nestled against me, her head on my chest. I bent down to kiss her forehead, and when I did, I thought I saw something move on the sheet next to us. I looked over and saw Claire's braid curling away from her body, as if trying to escape the bed. I reached over with my free arm to stroke the top of her head. As I did so, the braid moved. Claire hadn't shifted, and I was reaching over from the opposite side. Yet something caused her twisted locks to writhe on top of her silken sheets. Then the bulbous collection of hair gathered at the end of the braid rose like the head of a snake. It turned slowly toward me, then moved closer. The jewels in the clip at the end of it looked like eyes peering at me. Unexpectedly, what I saw didn't frighten me. I was instead overcome with a strong fascination, like that I felt when I first saw Claire at the Art Institute. I was oddly attracted to the serpentine braid. Good morning, my love, Claire said, raising her head to kiss me. I greeted her lips with my own and smiled, reassured to know that the previous evening hadn't been a dream. Then I looked back over at her braid. It lay motionless on the sheets. Had I imagined it moving? Breakfast? Claire asked as she slid out of bed and into a waiting kimono. Sure, I said with a grin. She gave me one more lingering kiss before she departed, pulling her braid out from under the thin fabric of the short robe so that it hung freely down her back. As she left, I could have sworn the end of that braid lifted and gave me one last inquisitive glance. Our relationship progressed rapidly from that point. Within weeks, we were dropping not-so-subtle hints to each other about a life together, making plans for trips we wanted to take, where would be a nice place to live and raise children. But the more time we spent together, the more I began to notice that I never saw Claire without her hair in its signature braid. She never brushed it out or washed it, at least not in my presence. One night, after making love, I asked innocently, Why do you always wear your hair in a braid? She reacted as if offended. You don't like my hair like this? No, it, it's not that. I was just curious. You have such beautiful hair, I just wonder what you would look like if it was unbraided. That's all. Claire got up from the bed and looked at me scornfully. If you love me, you won't ever say anything like that again. I was shocked. I'm sorry, I said, pleading. I reached for her hand, but she pulled away. Promise me you won't ask me to unbraid my hair, she begged. Please? Of course, I told her. I didn't know it was so important to you. I love your braid. Don't ever change it. Her consternation slowly melted away into a smile. She sat on the bed and took my hand in hers. Thank you, she said. Whatever you want, my love, I replied. Do you really mean that? she asked. Of course, I'd do anything for you. Are you really going to make me ask? She inquired, waving the vacant space on the ring finger of her left hand at me. I almost laughed. Bring me my pants, I said. What makes you think I want you to get dressed yet? She asked teasingly. Just bring them to me, I urged. Curious, Claire got up and crossed to the chair where I had left my clothes. As she picked up my pants, she noticed the lump in one pocket and reached in to pull out the ring box I had been carrying around for weeks. Is it? she asked excitedly. That depends on your answer. Yes, she shouted, without waiting to hear the question. She opened the box to reveal the ring inside, and quickly slid it onto her finger. After taking a moment to admire the two-and-a-half-carat diamond set in the gold band, she raced back over to the bed and threw her arms around me. Yes, 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 she repeated smothering me with her gratitude. And then Claire's kisses became deeper and longer as her kimono slipped from her shoulders and she slid under the sheets to join me. Our wedding was a grand affair. It was the first time I had met most of her family, and she, mine. Every one of my relatives thought she was wonderful and far too good for me. I agreed, but by then we had already affirmed our vows and sealed them with a kiss. The reception lasted well into the night. Claire danced, it seemed, with everyone. 
You could tell the women from her family as they had the same braids draped down their backs that she had. At one point, all of them had gathered together, forming a circle, holding hands and spinning wildly. Their braids swayed as if they weren't just carefully woven locks, but living extensions of themselves. Curiously, there were many of the men in her family who also had long hair gathered into ponytails or man buns, and those who didn't wore hats. Congratulations, Danny boy, Ivan said, clapping me on the back. He had been my best man and was doing his best to charm one of the bridesmaids. I never thought I'd see the day when you convinced some poor woman to be your wife. Thanks, Ivan, I said. His remarks didn't bother me. A matter of months earlier, I would have said the same thing about myself. You're next, buddy, I said. No, no. Didn't you notice I wasn't even in the room when you tossed the garter? We watched the spectacle of the Kinsley family women dancing, circling in a growing frenzy. Strange family, Ivan remarked. European, I explained. Really? What part? I'm not sure. Eastern Europe somewhere. I don't think Kinsley is their original name. Well, regardless, you got lucky, my friend. Don't screw it up, he advised, slapping my back one more time before wading into the melee of dancers. That night, Claire and I retired to our suite to continue the celebration of our love. We fell asleep in each other's arms, exhausted. I awoke when it was still dark. The champagne I consumed during the reception caught up to the capacity of my bladder, and I quietly slipped out of bed to use the bathroom, careful not to wake Claire. When I returned, she had shifted position so her back was toward me. Her black braid laid out atop the bedding. It might have been the lingering effects of the champagne or just my general fatigue, but I thought I saw it move. I sat up next to Claire's sleeping form, staring at that braid, wondering why it was so important that she kept her hair like that. It seemed so irrational. Did she really think I wouldn't love her if she looked different from that first time I met her? I reached out toward the small clip that secured the ball of hair at the end of her braid and removed it, curious as to whether it was solid hair or if she used something to give it its shape. It turns out there was something crumpled up into a ball inside the end of her braid. It looked like some kind of fabric, but when I touched it, it felt more like a very supple leather, as soft as skin. It seemed to be attached somehow to the braid itself. I started unwinding her silky hair, freeing those locks from the carefully crafted twists that bound them. As I did so, I realized they concealed a cord that seemed to be the same material that was balled up at the end of the braid. The tether was woven inside the strands of hair, all the way to the back of Claire's head. After a few minutes, I managed to untangle all of my bride's hair, so that it flowed like an inky river across the sheets. Laying atop her unbraided mane was the supple cord with the crumpled ball at its end. I couldn't quite see how it connected to Claire, perhaps a clip close to her scalp. I reached out to part the hair closer to her head when the crumpled up ball moved. I froze staring at the amorphous blob as it slowly opened up, rolling slightly. It wasn't just a crumpled up scrap of material like I first thought. It was some sort of animal. At least, that was my first impression. It had limbs, arms and legs that unfolded as it uncurled itself and rolled over onto what I guessed was its belly. The cord connecting it to Claire seemed to undulate in the dim light as the creature got to all fours then slowly stood and stared at me. It looked like a miniature person, a tiny woman, actually. She was completely hairless, and her black eyes stared up at me. I could tell she was female by the presence of breasts on her tiny chest. I leaned in to get a better look. As I did so, the cord that I could now see was attached to the creature's belly lifted her up. It wasn't limp. It seemed to be able to move and articulate, like a snake or a slender elephant's trunk. I reached out to touch her. She raised her tiny hands to her face and hissed like a cat. Then, suddenly, she was snatched away. Claire was awake and sitting up. She felt her hair cascading over her shoulders and quickly wrapped a sheet over her head so that only her face protruded. She stared at me, horrified. Dan, my hair, what have you done? I, I was just curious. 
She looked away from me, ashamed. What is that thing in your hair? I asked. Claire buried her face in her pillow and started sobbing. You promised, she said, her voice muffled. You promised you would never make me take down my braid. Claire, it's all right. I don't care. Whatever it is, just tell me. We're married now. We shouldn't have any secrets. She lifted her face away from the pillow and turned to face me. Do you really mean that? Of course, I told her, and I did. To be honest, though, if it had been anyone other than Claire with some strange little creature tangled up in her hair, I would have run from the room and probably the hotel, screaming. You're not afraid? she asked. No, not at all. Claire let the sheet fall down loosely over her shoulders. Her hair rustled, and the creature I had revealed emerged timidly, supported by the cord attached to her belly, the other end snaking around the back of Claire's head. What is it? I asked. I like to think of her as my sister. Your sister? I looked closer, and her tiny face was indeed a miniature duplicate of Claire's. She had the same nose, the same mouth, only instead of Claire's baby blue eyes, hers were black pools. Does she have a name? It's Tina, Claire replied, smiling that I was taking such a liking to the tiny naked version of herself. She's my Gemini. Gemini? I repeated, committing the name to memory. And she's attached to you? Claire pulled her hair to the side and showed where the cord attached to a point on the back of her head. I could see now that it was an extension of her, of her skin. I don't understand. Were you born this way? No, not initially. But as I grew, so did Tina. She started as a small bump on the back of my head. Then eventually her cord grew out, and when I was about fourteen... She turned into what you see now. I remembered the familial braids on exhibit at the wedding. Does everyone in your family have one? Claire nodded. Is it genetic? Actually, according to my cousin Beth, it's a virus. But it is passed down from mother to child. It replicates itself using my DNA, which is why it looks like me. Can it be removed? Tina recoiled at the suggestion. Claire shook her head. She is such a part of me that if we were separated, we would both die. I looked at the tiny little version of Claire, suspended in midair by the oddly articulable cord. Can she talk? No, but we know what each other is thinking. She's the one who told me you were staring at me at the art museum. Tina eased back closer to me and smiled. I felt that same sense of longing I experienced upon my first meeting with Claire. Was it some sort of psychic connection? Then I wondered, was it Tina I had fallen for? Of course, now that you know, you need to become a full member of the family. What does that mean? You must have your own Gemini. Wouldn't you like to have a little brother? It's really the most remarkable thing. You're never alone. How? I asked. Certainly, if it was a virus, I was already infected after all the intimate contact I'd had with Claire. Don't worry, it only hurts for a second. What hurts for only a second? Before Claire could answer, Tina's umbilical lifted her closer to my face. She opened her mouth to reveal two fangs inside her voiceless mouth. She shot up and bit me on the cheek, like a snake striking its prey. Fire erupted at the spot where her teeth broke my skin. My vision blurred, then dimmed as the world went dark. I was staring at the famous pointillism painting Sunday afternoon at the Grand Jatte by Surat when Ivan approached. I turned to greet him before he had a chance to slap me on the back. Hey there, Danny boy. Long time no see. I was getting worried that the little lady was keeping you on a short leash. Not at all, I assured him. We just had an extended honeymoon. You sly dog. I didn't know you had it in you. I ignored his innuendo. Say, what's with the hair? When did you start growing it out? Ivan asked. Claire likes it long, I explained. That's as good a reason as any. I guess I never figured you for the type to wear a man bun, though, Ivan remarked. I like it, I said, reaching up to gently touch the ball of hair gathered at the top of my head that concealed the embryonic gemini budding from my scalp. It's kind of growing on me. Thank you for listening to Unbraided, 
written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible, and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. By the way, my latest novel, Afterlife, A Rainy Day Investigation, is available now on Amazon and Audible. You can listen to the first book in this paranormal mystery series, Near Death, on this very podcast for free. Stop by bedtimestories.studio and sign up for our email list to be notified of new episodes and exclusive offers and get a free bookmark. You can visit richhosick.com to learn more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. Thanks again, and all the very best.